The premier event for infection prevention and control is coming to San Antonio this June. APIC's annual conference brings you the latest research, innovative products, and practical knowledge to help you prevent infection. From inspiring keynotes to thought-provoking panel discussions, APIC 24 curates an extraordinary platform for knowledge exchange. Meet IPs from around the world who face the same daily challenges as you. If you work in infection prevention and control, you don't want to miss this event. Learn more and register to join us in person or virtually at annual.apic.org. You're listening to The Five Second Rule, brought to you by APIC, the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology. Together with our nearly 16,000 members, we strive to create a safer world through the prevention of infection. Join us while we talk to infection preventionists and other experts to learn the truth about some common myths related to the risk of infection and to get tips to keep yourself and the people around you safe from infection. Hey, welcome back to another episode of Apex The Five Second Rule. We're here at episode 19, and we have a lot to talk about. Today's episode is all about COVID-19, influenza, and RSV. It's not so sneezy to tell the difference. You chuckle, but really these three respiratory illnesses can cause quite a bit of confusion. I'm Sylvia Quevedo. I'm the Director of Practice Guidance, and we have Dr. Angela Rasmussen joining us. How are you, Dr. Rasmussen? I'm doing well. Thanks, Sylvia. So you are quite the big kahuna. Uh, You're a virologist. You're an affiliate with the Georgetown Center for Global Health Science and Security. And you are also, I think you told me, getting ready to do some work in Canada. Tell us about that. That's right. So I'm moving uh, to um, Vito Intervac, which is the Vaccine Infectious Disease Organization International Vaccine Center. It's a research institute at the University of Saskatchewan. So I will be starting my new lab there uh, in a few weeks um, once I get across the border and and spend a couple weeks in mandatory quarantine. Wow, that sounds exciting. So I am so glad you have taken time to to talk with us here at the five second rule, which of course, you know, is all about infection prevention and control and patient safety. We love to showcase the work of our 16,000 plus members who are infection preventionists. We are committed to educating the public on all things related to infection prevention, because we think it's everybody's business. So here we are once again, uh, still in a global pandemic. Uh, Everybody's talking about COVID-19. But I'm glad you're here because you're going to shed some light for us on three really common, currently common infections, um, which include the flu, RSV, which is, um, help me with this because I always mispronounce it, but it's respiratory syncytial virus. You got it. Did I say that right? You did. Okay. So RSV, which anybody out there that uh, is a parent, has children, has probably heard of this, RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, certainly uh, COVID-19 caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and we'll get to all of that, and of course, influenza. Everybody knows flu. Um, So... This is what what today's episode is going to be about. Now, here's the thing that I want to get your thoughts on. I read that uh, RSV, for example, accounts for something like 40% of respiratory hospitalizations in all age groups. And this, by the way, is um, from an article by Matthias Hagwinet Shook and Pame, um, from emerging infectious diseases. So does that sound right to you, Dr. Rasmussen? So that does. Um, Respiratory syncytial virus does cause quite a bit of illness uh, in, especially in children. But I I think that it is, there's evidence emerging that it's underappreciated for how frequently it can cause uh, severe illness and hospitalization in adults as well. 
um, in spite of the fact that RSV is is a well-known virus, it's actually not necessarily studied as much as something like influenza. Um, and that's partly because I think that it it's not thought to have, quote unquote, pandemic potential. In many people, it actually does cause a very mild illness. Um, but one thing that I think the pandemic has revealed is that there are a lot of respiratory viruses out there, including RSV. And some of these uh, will be very mild in some people and in others, they they can exacerbate existing conditions. They can also cause severe illness uh, in, uh, you know, depending on the virus, uh, a number of cases. So I think that that, that does sound, sound right, to, right me. to me. Okay. So I want to go back to what you just said, which I found interesting, is that RSV is not, people aren't concerned about that causing a pandemic. Why? Well, in many adults, RSV causes a disease that's more like a common cold. Um, and that's really what people are thinking about when they're talking about pandemic potential. They're not necessarily talking about a virus that has the capability of spreading throughout the world, um, even though that is the definition of a pandemic. We deal with all kinds of viruses that that effectively do that or at least cause large epidemics in multiple places like seasonal influenza, like uh, the many different grab bag of viruses that, that cause the common cold. Um, and I think that that's why it's not thought of as something that is causing a pandemic the way that SARS coronavirus 2 has, the way that some uh, strains of influenza do, where there will be a noted increase in hospitalizations compared to what we normally see every cold and flu season. Okay. All right. Well, that's that makes sense. So here's why we're talking about this. Obviously, these are all respiratory illnesses, correct? These are viruses that cause um, some form of respiratory illness. Um, my understanding is the symptoms look a lot alike. So you you can have runny nose, coughing, um, fever in some cases, um, I know that influenza also, you might have aches and pains, muscle um, issues, fatigue. So one of the things I, I want to understand and help get you to help us understand is, you know, among these three uh, illnesses, are there tests that can differentiate what's what. In other words, especially now with COVID-19 and the pandemic, everybody thinks that they have COVID if they have the sniffles. But can you tell us, Dr. Rasmussen, what is available out there for clinicians to um, differentially diagnose these three illnesses? So for all three of these uh, illnesses now, there are both rapid antigen tests as well as a molecular uh, diagnostic assays such as PCR that are available to distinguish them. And all of those tests should, uh, with varying degrees of specificity and sensitivity, be able to distinguish between those. You're not going to get a positive RSV test, for example, and actually be infected with flu. All three of them are actually very different viruses. So the, the types of tests that are used, whether you're testing for antigen or for uh, the, the, gen the genome, which is what PCR tests for, um, will allow you to distinguish which of these viruses uh, a patient may have. But it also is important to note that there are a lot of other respiratory viruses that are very common during cold and flu season um, that may not be detected by these, such as rhinovirus, um, such as other types of coronaviruses that we've heard a lot about in the past year because they cause uh, a significant percentage of common colds. Um, as, as well as adenoviruses and things like that. So, uh, you know, there are tests for for influenza A virus, at least um, for RSV and for SARS coronavirus 2, um, but they are not necessarily going to detect every single respiratory virus that's out there and can infect people. Okay, so for sure we've got tests. That's great. What about transmission? Can you talk to us a little bit about how easy it is to catch, say, influenza versus COVID versus RSV? Well, again, this is going to depend on the virus. And then as we're seeing with SARS coronavirus, too, um, a lot of transmission is situational. You know, we are seeing with influenza, for example, this year there was hardly any influenza cases, probably because people 
are staying home. Uh, they are not being exposed to influenza in the workplace, in school, things like that. And that's the thing about viruses. They need to have a host in order to uh, survive and persist in the population. Um, we know that respiratory viruses all can be transmitted by three basic routes. There's, of course, inhalation. Um, sometimes that is called airborne, although that can be somewhat controversial, uh, depending for infection preventionists, especially when you're talking about what type of PPE you need to use. But you can acquire all three of these viruses from inhaling uh, respiratory particles that are in the air. You can also contact them, uh, contract these uh, through direct contact transmission or droplet transmission. This is when uh, somebody who is infected sneezes um, and that lands on part of your body and uh, either directly in your respiratory tract, your eyes, um, or on your hands, and then you touch your nose. And that is effectively droplet or direct contact transmission. And then there is uh, indirect contact or fomite transmission, which is certainly for SARS coronavirus 2 at least less common. There's some debate as to how frequently it occurs with influenza and RSV, um, although fomite transmission has been demonstrated clearly for both of those viruses. So that's uh, another possible route of transmission, again, though, that will depend on the circumstances. Um, fomite transmission in particular is is complicated because it, it does depend a lot on the type of virus and how long that virus particle can remain infectious in the environment. Right. And just for our, our listeners, uh, fomite, we're talking about surfaces. So Correct. countertops, in the case of our kiddos, you know, their toys and anything that they touch. So that's what we mean by a fomite, how long at that particular virus can live uh, on a surface outside, as you said, Dr. Rasmussen, because the viruses, you know, we have this relationship um, with them, often dysfunctional, <laughs> and uh, they need us, right? They need us to survive and replicate because we're hearing a lot about that um, during the pandemic, understanding how viruses um, evolve and, and within us, correct? That's correct. So a virus is an obligate parasite and uh, can't reproduce on its own. And for that reason, um, some people, you know, this is a, a old philosophical argument in the field of virology as to whether viruses are even alive or not. Um, obviously, they're biological entities, but is something alive if it can't reproduce independently? Um, viruses cannot. Uh, so they they always require a host. And uh, that's, that's where this comes into fomite transmission. Um, it will depend heavily on the environmental conditions how long that virus is going to remain infectious on a given surface. And that that is exactly what a fomite is. It's a contaminated object that has virus on it. If you are in, say, a deep freezer or a, a refrigerator even, and somebody um, contaminates a surface there with, with virus, then you're probably going to be at a higher risk a long while after that um, than if you're out, outdoors in the middle of the of a sunny day. Um, sunlight can inactivate viruses like this. Uh, the temperature and humidity conditions can disrupt the structure of the virus particles for enveloped viruses like all three of these viruses. So um, a lot of these, as much as person-to-person -person transmission uh, through droplets or inhalation is highly situational, so is fomite transmission. Okay, so I know with uh, with SARS-CoV-2, um, early on in the pandemic, there was, you know, you couldn't get, you couldn't get cleaners, you couldn't get anything to clean surfaces, people went crazy. We have since um, determined that there's obviously more concern about airborne uh, transmission and, and sort of breathing in those droplets. Um, in the case of influenza, that too is true, right? You're, you're in a room with someone, they have influenza, they sneeze, they cough, we're at risk for um, getting the flu from that individual if we're not vaccinated. So I do want to get to the vaccination um, issue. But RSV as well, you've got your child who goes to daycare or, or school, um, they come home, they're exhibiting symptoms, they sneeze, they cough, or they're touching th um, surfaces, that's how we can get it. Did I, did I capture all of that? You did. Um, 
there's there's one other thing that people should consider, and I think that this doesn't get talked about as much, but there's also the issue of dose. Um, so I think a lot of people think that if you get exposed to a single particle of virus that you're going to automatically get infected. And while that happens in the lab, in tissue culture, um, that's not what happens in the real world. We will probably, for all of these viruses, have to be exposed to a minimum number of infectious virus particles. Just really, it's a numbers game um, so that they can overcome all the different barriers to infection that you naturally have. So you will need to overcome you know, physical obstacles like nose hairs that will block out larger particles, uh, mucus, which um, its function is to line the respiratory tract and protect the epithelial cells that do line that the, the airway from uh, exposure to viruses. Those viruses will have to come into contact with a cell that actually has the receptor on it, and they will have to get into that cell and then evade the, the host's um, antiviral innate immune system. So all of those uh, issues. And then if actually if people are vaccinated, um, they will also have to get around any antibodies that might be in the, the respiratory tract. So there's all these different barriers to infection. So it's not just a matter of coming into contact with virus via one of those routes that we described. Um, it's also a matter of coming into contact with a sufficient exposure dose of that virus to actually establish a productive infection. So, yeah, basically we have an immune system that, you know, is our army. And, you know, shout out to nose hair, right? Super important here. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> shout out shout, shout out, out, to shout out to snot. Shout out to snot. It's so important. Um, and then, listen, sidebar, I am a huge, huge fan of TWIV this week in virology. Do you listen to that, Dr. Rasmussen? I do. And actually, I did my PhD with Vincent Rockinello, who's oh the host my of Twiff. Oh, my God. Well, listen, I may get in trouble for saying this, but I am dying to get them on the five-second rule. So maybe, you know, we can talk later. But on TWIV, This Week in Virology, uh, I don't remember which episode. We haven't caught up at the five-second rule. We we're only up at, what, 19. But they talked also about skin um, and how important, you know, your skin is, uh, it, which is – it, it, we're bombarded every second by millions of microbes that our skin protects us. So I thought that was kind of cool. Um, you made me think yeah, of that. Yeah, I think that people don't give enough credit in general to the natural barriers uh, of our skin, of mucus, um, of the the various physical obstacles that pathogens have to to try to get across. Um, so definitely shout out to shout out to barriers providing passive immune benefits. So, Dr. Rasmussen, will SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, become much like influenza and RSV, a seasonal illness that we'll have to contend with? So it, it remains to be seen if it's going to become actually seasonal, but I do think that it's very likely to become endemic. Um, and there's a couple reasons for that. One is that the, the vaccines that we have are excellent but they don't provide uh, completely sterilizing immunity. So there's still the possibility that, that people will be passing it onto each other uh, or new variants might be selected that can get around the vaccines more easily. Um, we're also not vaccinating the entire world at a brisk clip. Uh, so there will be vulnerable populations that the virus can continue to spread and evolve in. And then furthermore, there are a number of different animal species that can be infected with SARS coronavirus too. Uh, cats. Um, we've just learned that the B1351 and P1 variants uh, can also infect rodents. Um, so there is the possibility that the virus could be um, established in a new wildlife reservoir, in which case it will be very difficult to eradicate. So I think that um, there's certainly a possibility that that it will become endemic. Now, whether it becomes seasonal or not is actually a different question. I think that in uh, the, the further northern latitudes and further southern latitudes uh, where there are colder winters, um, there certainly could be an element of seasonality just because people will be gathering indoors uh, in indoor environments that are more conducive to transmission. I think um, the reason it's not going to be like flu necessarily is that flu is actually maintained in its wildlife reservoir of migratory birds 
that migrate back and forth based on the season. So that's another uh, factor that drives influenza seasonality. Um, but that said, again, just people's behaviors change with the seasons and with the weather. And that certainly could uh, create basically a, a flu, you know, COVID season um, that that is just associated with increased transmission because people by necessity are having to spend more time indoors to get out of the cold. All right. So let me go back. We th- There is a method to this madness. So three really, uh, sadly, you know, now I would say COVID is eventually probably uh, going to be another coronavirus that we as humans must contend with going forward. Um, so, so we have tests in the case of influenza and now um, SARS-CoV-2. We have vaccines. Yay. Is there anything for RSV? So not to my knowledge. And uh, I'm sure that there are vaccines in development for RSV. But uh, back in the, the late 60s, early 70s, there was a vaccine developed for RSV uh, that, that got rolled out um, to the public. And it turned out that that vaccine actually made RSV disease worse. Uh, so so there are this is something that can happen with vaccines. It doesn't happen very often. Uh, I should add there is no indication whatsoever that this occurs with influenza vaccines or that this occurs with any of the SARS coronavirus 2 vaccines that are out now. Um, but it is something that you look for in clinical trials. And that's uh, where where a vaccine can actually enhance disease. And it's thought to do this by um, triggering adaptive immune responses that lead to airway hyperreactivity. So by getting vaccinated, you're actually priming your system for a, a response to the virus that's actually very harmful and will make disease worse. This happened, again, this was about 40 years ago uh, with, with RS, an RSV vaccine that was developed. And I think that that uh, has really hampered vaccine development for RSV uh, going forward because people obviously don't want to make another vaccine that's actually harmful rather than protective. Right. But that's RSV. It's it's relatively mild, but we have wonderful vaccines for influenza. So, you know, get your shot when it's available. Um, we now have COVID-19 vaccines. We have, at least in the United States, three that are um, under emergency use authorization. And happy to say I'm fully vaccinated. woo <laughs> Um, so, so the importance going forward is certainly to advocate for all of us to get any vaccine that is available to us to combat these, these respiratory illnesses. Um, certainly Dr. Rasmussen, um, here at the five second rule, we cannot get through an episode without, you know, wash your hands, uh, because some of these can be transmitted, um, via surfaces, you've got your child who comes home with her, his or her snot, having touched a million things. So what, hand washing is really important. Um, getting your vaccine. Any other recommendations for preventing uh, the spread? Well, for all of these viruses, I think we can learn some really important lessons from this pandemic. Um, and that I think the most important lesson for me going forward is that risk reduction is additive. Um, There are a number of different measures that we can take, different precautions that we can apply in different situations that will reduce our risk of uh, being infected with one of these viruses if we're exposed to it. Of course, staying home. Now, that's something that's specific to the the COVID-19 pandemic. I don't think that we're going to be all working from home and upcoming flu seasons, um, but but certainly maintaining physical distance, uh, being mindful of environments that are very crowded uh, are, all, are all ways to reduce your risk of being exposed to one of these viruses, um, wearing a mask. Uh, I think that is something that we might start applying, at least for people who are sick with, uh, with a common cold. You know, if you are symptomatic with uh, mild cold like symptoms, maybe we should start wearing a mask. Um, This is common practice in other parts of the world uh, throughout East and Southeast Asia. For example, people routinely wear masks uh, if they're not feeling well. Um, Some people wear masks uh, just during cold and flu season. We know that 
adding that extra layer of protection can also reduce exposure risk. And then, of course, uh, thinking about ventilation. Um, Maybe this is a a good excuse to think about the way that we're designing buildings. Um, Not that every single building has has a need to be hospital-level air exchanges and ventilation, um, but we can start rethinking that and maybe make some some changes where it's affordable and where it's practical to do so. And then finally, as you just emphasized, um, I think people need to continually uh, be reminded to practice good hand hygiene, um, to uh, disinfect high-touch surfaces. Um, I, I've read a number of articles that suggest that maybe we're spending too much time on disinfection and I disagree with that. I think that, you know, we certainly shouldn't be engaging in hygiene theater, disinfecting the ceiling or surfaces that people never touch. Um, We shouldn't be relying on disinfection as a replacement for other risk reduction methods, but we should continue to disinfect surfaces. There are a number of pathogens that can be transmitted uh, from contaminated surfaces or, or by fomites in addition to respiratory illnesses. So I think that by implementing as many of those different precautions as we can uh, during cold and flu season, that's going to reduce our risk. Okay, so yeah, so we have the tools, we know what to do. Certainly, um, just to touch on some of our our healthcare colleagues and how they're managing this, um, you know, the challenge during the pandemic is you know, I heard a doctor many years ago say to me, you know, common things are common, right? So we're in a, we're in a pandemic, you get the sniffles, as I was starting to say earlier, you know, you're a parent, you go to the doctor, you know, you're thinking, oh my God, it's COVID when in fact it might be RSV. Now, obviously kids have not been in school during the pandemic, at least in the United States for the most part. Um, What is it that our healthcare community needs to know about personal protective equipment. So we know that if you have a laboratory confirmed case of COVID-19 in your healthcare setting, um, that the recommendation is to the extent that there is available uh, N95 respirators that one uses that. What is the case with influenza and RSV, say in the pediatric realm, or what are we saying to our healthcare workers about PPE needed for influenza and RSV confirmed cases or suspected cases? Yeah. So this is a really tough issue um, because I'm certainly not advocating that healthcare workers should be given inadequate PPE. But that said, a lot of the infection that we've seen from healthcare workers has actually occurred either in the community or it has occurred uh, in situations in which people are not masked um, at all, wearing any kind of mask. I think that we definitely need to be rethinking uh, how all masks, all medical masks, whether they're surgical masks or N95 respirators, are fitting the people wearing them. Um, as as certainly the, the listeners of this podcast probably know, fit is incredibly important for wearing masks. So do I think there needs to be a blanket recommendation uh, to provide all healthcare workers with N95s at all times? Maybe not. I think that in some situations, you know, we haven't seen widespread airborne transmission throughout hospitals uh, the, the way that that we would for, for another potentially more contagious virus. I mean, in, in many cases, it does look like droplet protection, droplet precautions are actually pretty effective because in hospitals, uh, there, there's certainly adequate ventilation. Um, there's often air filtration. Uh, people are very mindful about isolating patients. Um, in some cases, there's negative pressure rooms, things like that. But that said, I feel like um, at this point, many healthcare workers have also demanded access to N95 masks and shortages of N95 respirators have been uh, a real problem worldwide. So I do think that we need to at least have a a larger supply of N95 masks available um, for people, especially, and I think it really should be people's choice um, in many situations too. If they feel more comfortable healthcare workers, uh, and actually the general public as well, if they feel more comfortable wearing an N95 respirator, 
more power to them. I think that we don't have enough N95 respirators to make those recommendations. But I don't think that in every healthcare situation, an N95 respirator is needed. And then, of course, I think people should also um, be very mindful of wearing face shields or eye protection, just because uh, one thing we don't actually know is how common the ocular route of transmission is uh, in the real world. But we certainly know that it's been experimented, experimentally demonstrated for, for COVID-19 in animal models. Um, we also know that the eyes uh, connect uh, with the, the respiratory system through the nasolacrimal ducts. So um, I think that it is also important to emphasize eye protection as well as uh, respiratory protection. Oh, totally agree. Well, on the matter of N95s, they certainly have to be fit tested. So just want to make everybody aware of that. Absolutely. Um, So it's not like you just grab it off the shelf and put it on and hope it works. So, but do not despair because episode 15 of this podcast uh, talks about airborne transmission. And um, I think it was episode 17 is on PPE. So it's all here. Um, And yeah, to your point, I think You know, certainly APIC as an organization has been uh, advocating and lobbying for adequate personal protective equipment of all kinds for the healthcare uh, community. So APIC's going to continue to do that. And certainly, you know, I think you're right. People need to feel comfortable. I think we're going to see some major shifts in the use of masks, even among the public. Um, I think that's just going to become more standard, uh, especially during flu season. Um, So tons to talk about. We could go on forever. Like you said, the eyes. I don't think most people realize your eyes are mucous membranes, right? That your eyeballs. They are. are. They're mucosal surfaces. It's, It's crazy. Yeah, we don't pay attention to eyes. I know that that's something that's getting more attention at, um, the CDC and other places to look at, you know, the requirements around eye protection. So, so much to talk about. I, of course, could go on forever. Like I said, a huge fan of all of the work of of scientists like yourself in virology, helping to uh, unravel the mysteries of these, these interesting beings, these viruses, and how they, uh, how they make life difficult for us at, at times. Um, But hopefully we have uh, shed some light on the differences between RSV, COVID-19, and influenza. Remember to to get the vaccine if it's available for COVID-19 and um, and influenza. And wash those hands, wash those surfaces, and uh, keep up with the science and listen to experts such as Dr. Angela Rasmussen. Thank you so much for taking the time with us today. Oh, it's really my pleasure. And I I feel like I could probably go on quite a bit longer. But can I say one more thing? Um, this uh, This is with regard to when we should be making recommendations for PPE. One thing I think that's really important for people to be mindful of is that certainly for SARS coronavirus 2, for some strains of influenza, and in some cases of RSV, people may be infected and contagious and not showing symptoms. So it is, regardless of the types of PPE recommendations that are going to be appropriate for a certain circumstance, and I rely on infection prevention and control experts uh, to, to to have the final word on that. Um, I think that people should be aware that that screening for symptoms is not the best way to protect yourself against any of these different respiratory viruses. During cold and flu season, people should be very mindful of wearing the appropriate PPE that's recommended for them in the right circumstance because somebody who seems completely fine might actually be contagious and just not know it yet. Uh, so um, that's that's just the one extra piece I'd like to add is that it's we're getting a much better appreciation for asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic transmission because of this pandemic. And that's something that is possible for for many other respiratory viruses. So be mindful, even if it doesn't seem like you are around other sick people. Oh my God. Excellent point. I, I think you're absolutely right. I think the public now is aware that these viruses, these, these microbes can travel and we don't even know it. 
you know, and we're, we're feeling fine. We're out and about and yet we are, we're spreading it. So yeah, excellent point. I too could go on forever as everyone knows. Um, but alas, we'll just have to, we'll just have to do part two of this, but certainly want to thank you for joining us at the five second rule. I want to remind everybody to check out www.apic.org. And oh, by the way, There's a great book called Ready Reference for Microbes by Kathy Brooks, and you can look up all of these different viruses and bacteria and fungi and find out all kinds of cool things like how long they last on a on a surface, how you how they're transmitted. So, so much to learn. I want to thank Dr. Rasmussen again and wish you all the best of luck on your new gig. And maybe we'll have you back. That would be wonderful. Even though I'm going to Canada, uh, as I will still be affiliated with Georgetown and I'll still be an American. So I, I do uh, fall into the, the American uh, side of things, too. Well, they listen to us up in Canada, you know, so we'll spread the word up there. Thank you so much, Sylvia. Thanks for listening to The Five Second Rule, produced by the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology Staff and the APIC Communications Committee, in partnership with Human Factor. Audio Tech is Blake Alfin.